Welcome, and thank you for standing by. Today's conference is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect at this time. I will now turn the conference over to Michael Hawes with the U.S. Census Bureau. Thank you. You may begin. Thank you, operator. Good afternoon, or to those further west, good morning. Uh, I'm Michael Hawes, Senior Advisor for Data Access and Privacy at the U.S. Census Bureau. Welcome to the second webinar in our series on understanding the 2020 Census Disclosure Avoidance System. Today's session will discuss the motivations behind our initiative to modernize the disclosure avoidance methods we use to protect census data. The Census Bureau has long been a world leader in the research, design, and implementation of the disclosure avoidance safeguards that can be used to protect privacy in published data products. But the landscape of privacy risk is constantly changing, and part of our obligation to safeguard the public's data is to ensure that the methods we use to protect the confidentiality of census data remain sufficient to counter new and emerging privacy threats. Today's session will examine the Census Bureau's evaluation of the disclosure avoidance methods used to protect the confidentiality of the 2010 Census. And as we will discuss, the results of our simulated reconstruction abetted re-identification attacks on the 2010 Census were alarming and provided conclusive evidence that stronger and more sophisticated disclosure avoidance methods are necessary to protect against these new types of privacy attacks. I'm joined today by my colleagues Rolando Rodriguez and Nathan Goldschlag, who have been actively involved in performing these simulations. Throughout the presentation, feel free to ask any questions that you may have in the Q&A feature of the WebEx platform. Rolando and Nathan will be answering your questions during the presentation, and we'll have some additional time at the end of the session to answer your remaining questions. Before I start, I would like to thank my colleagues at the Census Bureau who have contributed to the information in this presentation. Any opinions and viewpoints expressed today are entirely my own and do not represent the opinions or viewpoints of the U.S. Census Bureau. Concern about privacy in public data releases is not new. For almost a century, the Census Bureau and other statistical agencies around the world have employed various methods of disclosure avoidance to protect respondent confidentiality in their public data products. In recent years, however, technological advances have fundamentally transformed the privacy landscape. Over the last decade, computer scientists and privacy experts have been loudly and repeatedly warning that frequently used data protection methods are increasingly insufficient to counter these threats. In 2010, noted privacy law expert Paul Ohm warned that computer scientists have demonstrated that they can often re-identify or de-anonymize individuals hidden in anonymized data with astonishing ease. In their 2012 privacy framework, the U.S. Federal Trade Commission likewise concluded that there is significant evidence demonstrating that technological advances and the ability to combine disparate pieces of data can lead to identification of a consumer even if the individual pieces of data do not constitute personally identifiable information. Moreover, continued the Federal Trade Commission, not only is it possible to re-identify non-PII data through various means, businesses actually have strong incentives to do so. And in 2014, the President's Council on Advisors on Science and Technology warned that anonymization is not robust against near-term future re-identification methods. It's a generally recognized best practice for practitioners of disclosure avoidance mechanisms to periodically assess and evaluate the effectiveness of the disclosure avoidance techniques they employ. And the Census Bureau has regularly been performing these types of disclosure risk assessments and has modified or changed its privacy protection approaches as those assessments have identified new vulnerabilities. For the decennial census, these evaluations led to notable changes in 1990 when we transitioned from suppression to record swapping. And again, a decade later, when we updated and enhanced the swapping methodology for use in the 2000 and 2010 censuses. Traditionally, however, these assessments of disclosure risk have typically focused on the disclosure risk for a small set of possible attack vectors. Traditional re-identification attacks on microdata products, 
or simple deduction or subtraction attacks on tabular data releases. The recent technological advances I mentioned a moment ago, most notably significant increases in computing power and the development of powerful optimization algorithms, have opened up a new and worrisome vector for attack. And it's one that can be leveraged by anyone with a basic undergraduate level familiarity with computer science and with cheap access to a cloud computing environment. This new disclosure risk comes from reconstruction abetted re-identification attacks on tabular data releases. To understand the threat posed by reconstruction abetted attacks, it's helpful to understand how database reconstruction works. In 2003, in what became known as the database reconstruction theorem, it was mathematically demonstrated that every time you release any statistic calculated from a confidential data source, you reveal or leak a small amount of private or confidential information. If you release too many statistics too accurately, you will eventually reveal the entire underlying confidential data source. There's a common misperception that aggregating data would be sufficient to protect privacy. And while that may have once been the case and may still be true for some limited data releases, it's not sufficient to protect privacy in large scale statistical data products. In fact, aggregating tabular data can often be thought of like a giant game of Sudoku. With Sudoku, if you have enough numbers pre-populated into the grid, there's one and only one solution to the puzzle. Well, so too when you publish enough data tables. Eventually, with enough data tables at your disposal, disaggregated in different ways, there would be one and only one set of individual level records that could have yielded the published tabular results. And while it might have seemed unthinkable a decade ago, computer algorithms can now perform these reconstructions of individual level records from the aggregate tabular data often quite easily. So let's look at a toy example. Imagine that you collected some basic demographics about the seven people who live on a particular block. You then publish some aggregate descriptive statistics about those people. How many were female? How many were black? What's the median age of married individuals? And so on. Well, with those basic aggregate statistics, it's a trivial matter to solve for the only set of individual level records that could have yielded those results. In fact, it took a 2013 MacBook Pro all of 0.2 seconds to reconstruct these individual level records. And our would-be attacker now has individual level data for everyone on the block, except for names. Well, it turns out that attaching the names to those records is often a relatively trivial exercise as well. While the reconstructed records lacked names, they did have some indirect identifiers that can be used to link to an outside data source that does have names on it. In this particular example, the attacker could use block location, age, and sex to match the reconstructed records to third-party data, for example, voter registration lists. Now it's easy to attach the name to the records and you just learn Jane, Joe, and John's race and relationship status. The principal mechanism that the Census Bureau used to protect confidentiality for the 2000 and 2010 censuses was a technique known as data swapping. To perform this swapping, the Census Bureau first identified households that were considered most vulnerable to re-identification especially households on smaller population blocks whose residents had differing demographic characteristics from the rem remainder of their block. While every non-imputed household record in the census edited file, or CEF, had a chance of being selected for data swapping, records from more vulnerable households, those on, typically those on low population blocks, uh, were selected with greater probability. Then the records for all members of those selected households were exchanged with the records of households in nearby geographic areas that matched on some key characteristics. For the 2000 and 2010 censuses, those key matching characteristics were the whole number of persons in the household and the whole number of persons 18 years of age or older in the household. These swapping criteria resulted in the total population and the total voting age population for each block being held invariant. That is, 
while noise was added to all the remaining characteristics through the swapping mechanism, no noise was added to the block level total population or block level voting age population counts. And this becomes important for reasons we're about to discuss in a moment. Once the swapping had been completed, the swapped microdata records are known as the 100% detail file or HDF. The published tabular summaries for the 2010 census were tabulated directly from the HDF with no further disclosure avoidance performed. To produce the public use microdata sample or PUMS, additional disclosure avoidance methods were deemed necessary. The official 2010 PUMS had a geographic population threshold of 100,000 people. It collapsed categories to national population thresholds of 10,000, used partially synthetic data for group quarters populations, and used top coding, bottom coding, and noise infusion for large households. And the PUMS was then sampled from the swapped version of the 2010 HDF, not from the original confidential census edited file. So recognizing the feasibility of reconstruction attacks on published tabular summaries, the Census Bureau decided that we needed to conduct a simulated attack on the disclosure avoidance methods that we used in 2010 to protect the 2010 Census. Our goal was to evaluate whether the record swapping algorithms that were used to protect those published tabular summaries were sufficient to mitigate disclosure risk. So database reconstruction is the process of statistically recreating the individual level records from which a set of published tabulations were originally calculated. That, it, that is, database reconstruction attempts to reverse engineer the confidential input data that was used in statistical tabulations. These reconstructed records can then be subjected to a simulated re-identification attack through linkage to an external data source that contains common indirect identifiers, for example, uh, block location, age, and sex, along with the individual's names and addresses. The first step of our simulated attack on the 2010 census was to reconstruct the block level microdata from published tabular summaries of the 2010 census. Now, the 2010 Census released over 150 billion statistics as part of its official data products. The simulated reconstruction attack used as its input a small fraction of those statistics, approximately 6.2 billion of them, uh, contained in these published files from SF1 uh, from the 2010 Census. Because the parameters of the 2010 census swapping methodology included those invariants on total population and voting age population at the block level, the reconstruction was able to exactly reconstruct all 308,745,538 records with correct block location and voting age, whether each individual in the block was under 18 or 18 years of age or older. As we'll see shortly, this provides would-be attackers with an enormous advantage because they know the exact population count for each block, uh, and that significantly increases the efficiency of those re-identification attacks. Even minimal uncertainty about the block-level population counts would provide substantial protection against accurate reconstruction and re-identification. With the exact reconstructions of the 308 million records with the correct block and voting age, the reconstruction of the 2010 census microdata for sex, age, race, Hispanic, Latino, ethnicity, and census block variables was carried out by constructing a system of equations consistent with the published tables that once solved could then be converted into microdata. This system of equations was solved using Gorobi, a commercial mixed integer linear programming software tool. Then to assess the accuracy of these reconstructed individual level records, the team performed exact record linkage of the five variables in the reconstructed microdata to the same five variables in the census edited file, the CEF, which is the confidential data, uh, and also to the 100% detailed file, the HDF, which was the swapped versions of those individual records before tabulation. 
The results are summarized in this table. The left file of the record linkage uh, is in the first column. And the right file is the reconstructed microdata from SF1. The agreement, the agreement rates shown include block, which was never wrong, sex, age and years, race to the 63 OMB designated race categories, and Hispanic ethnicity. And they're computed as a population, as, sorry, as a percentage of the total population. Exact agreement means all five variables agreed precisely bit for bit. Fuzzy age agreement means that the block, sex, race, and Hispanic ethnicity agreed exactly, but age agreed only plus or minus one year. For example, uh, age 25 on the CEF is in fuzzy age agreement with ages 24 through 26 in the reconstructed data. The one error agreement rate allows one variable, sex, age outside of that plus or minus one year range, race or ethnicity to be wrong. Most errors in the reconstructed file are that the age variable is off by plus or minus two years rather than just plus or minus one. This error is the balance of the width of the five-year categories that were used in the block level summaries. Hence, even though the disclosure avoidance requirement for the 2010 Census SF1 tabular summaries specified block level aggregation to five-year age bins for those aged 20 years and older, uh, the effective aggregation was far less. This figure shows the distribution of agreement rates by block size. Agreement rates are only substantially lower than the population averages shown on the previous slide for blocks with populations between zero and nine people, which is where the Census Bureau had said it concentrated the swaps used. However, uniqueness on sex, age, race, and ethnicity is not limited to small population blocks. This, in essence, is one of the principal failures of the 2010 Census Disclosure Avoidance Methodology. Swapping provided protection for households deemed at risk, primarily those in blocks with small population, whereas for the entire 2010 Census, uh, full 57% of individuals are population uniques on the basis of block, sex, age, race, and ethnicity. Furthermore, 44% of those are population uniques on block, age, and sex. This table shows the distribution of the population by the size of the block where the person resides. Only 2.6% of the population lives in blocks with one to nine people. Uh, this is significant because these are very small blocks and they're the ones most likely to be protected by the 2010 census swapping methodology. Almost 22% of the population live in blocks with 10 to 49 residents, and 22.3% live in blocks with 50 to 99 people. Fully 46.8% of the population lives in a block with fewer than 100 residents. The column labeled percent of block sex age uniques in bin shows the percentage of the residents of the block who are unique in that block by sex and age in years values. This percentage ranges from almost everyone, 95% in the least populous blocks, to very few, 1.1% in the most populous ones. There's no simulated or reconstructed data used in this table. These are the characteristics of the 2010 census resident population as they appear in the 2010 census edited file, the original unswapped confidential data. The existence of documented population uniques, even one, not to mention 135 million of them, triggers mandatory active disclosure limitation under the disclosure avoidance rules that were in place for the 2010 census. If presented with a proposed public use microdata file containing the variables of census block, sex, age, race, and ethnicity uh, in 1990, 2000, 2010, or 2020, the Census Bureau Disclosure Review Board would have insisted on aggregation of the census block codes into more populous geographic areas and would have imposed minimum population sizes of at least 100,000 uh, and minimum population thresholds for the race and ethnicity coding. It would also have insisted on sampling from those population uh, totals. The reconstruction
construction experiment demonstrated that existing technology can convert the Census Bureau's traditional tabular summaries of census data, uh, which was released in 2010, into a 100% coverage microdata file geocoded all the way down to the block level with very limited noise, which we didn't release in 2010. Uh, this 100% microdata file contains so much detail that it would have been deemed unreleasable if it had been proposed in conjunction with the original 2010 census data products. So the ability to reconstruct the microdata means that there's now a significant disclosure risk for the 10, 2010 census summary files 1 and 2, uh, as well as the American Indian Alaska Native summary file. There are approximately 150 billion statistics across those three data products. Because of the features that I mentioned a moment ago, releasing this many very accurate statistics made the ensemble of those publications equivalent to releasing the 2010 100% detailed file, that swapped version of the census edited file. There can be no uncertainty about this. The tabular publications from the 2010 census were equivalent to releasing every tabulation variable in the HDF uh, for the entire universe of individuals. Now, they didn't have hierarchical structure, so while person and household records could be fully reconstructed, they couldn't directly be linked to each other. Uh, our team that demonstrated this vulnerability stopped after reconstructing person-level records for block, sex, age, and race, and Hispanic ethnicity because the vulnerability had been fully, fully exposed mathematically and demonstrated empirically. So there are 308 million 745,538 person records and 131 million 704,730 housing unit records in both the 2010 100% detail file and the 2010 census edited file, linked in their correct hierarchy. For the unswapped records in the HDF, the images are identical to their SEF counterparts. For the swapped household records, the block identifier, household size, um, voting age, household size, occupancy, and tenure variables are identical to their unswapped counterparts. And for the person record, the, the voting age variable is identical to the unswapped counterpart. A public use microdata file containing the 308 million person records in the HDF, uh, including only the five tabulation variables, block, sex, age, race, and Hispanic ethnicity, uh, is so disclosive that it would have not passed the disclosure avoidance criteria used for the 2010 census public use microdata sample. Furthermore, the same file would not have passed disclosure avoidance criteria applied to the SF1 itself. Uh, as I mentioned, the 2010 PUMS had geographic population thresholds of 100,000. Uh, it collapsed categories to those national population thresholds of 10,000, and it used partially synthetic data for the group quarters populations, along with top coding, bottom coding, and noise infusion for large households. And then the PUMS was further sampled from the swapped version of the HDF, not from the census edited file. This failure to apply microdata disclosure avoidance to the SF1 tabulations matters because the reconstructed 2010 microdata for block sex, age, race, and Hispanic ethnicity are a very accurate image of the 100% detail file. And the 100% detail file is itself a very accurate image of the SEF, which is the reason that the HDF is also considered confidential. Consequently, the new technology-enabled possibility of accurately reconstructing HDF microdata from the published tabular summaries and the fact that those reconstructed data do not meet the disclosure avoidance standards established at the time for microdata products that were derived from the HDF demonstrate that the swapping methodology as implemented for the 2010 census no longer meets the acceptable disclosure risk standards that were established when the swapping mechanism was selected for the 2010 census. So having demonstrated that a 100% microdata file can be successfully reconstructed from the published 2010 census tabulations, the Census Bureau proceeded to use these reconstructed microdata to simulate a re-identification attack on those data. To perform a simulated re-identification attack, you begin by identifying a person-level data source file that contains name, address, sex, and birth date. For an external attacker, this would often be a commercially available database. 
we did two different versions of simulated attacks. One with the commercially available data from the 2010 time period itself, and one with the, the census edited file as the source file to simulate higher quality commercial data that may be available. And I'll explain more about that in a minute. Once you've identified the source file, you convert the names and addresses to their corresponding Census Bureau Protected Identification Key, or PIC. Uh, you then identify the corresponding census block for every address in the source file, and then looping through all the records in the reconstructed microdata file uh, produced from the reconstruction, you find the first record in the source file that matches exactly on block, sex, and age. Once this step is completed, you run through the remaining unmatched records from the reconstructed microdata and find the first unmatched record from the source file that matches exactly on block and sex and matches on age plus or minus one year. When both steps have been completed, output the records with the successful matches from these two passes. These are called putative re-identifications because they appear to link the reconstructed microdata to a real name and address associated with the block. These are the records the hypothetical attacker thinks are re-identified. Putative re-identifications are not necessarily correct. An external attacker would have to do extra field work to estimate the confirmation rate, which is the percentage of putative re-identifications that are correct. An external attacker might estimate the confirmation rate by contacting a sample of the putative re-identifications to confirm the name and address. Uh, they might also perform more sophisticated verification using multiple source files to select the name and address most consistent across all files. For our simulations, we verified using the Census Bureau Protected Identification Key, the PIC, to confirm the accuracy of the IDs uh, and their corresponding race and ethnicity values. Now, at the Census Bureau, we usually estimate the confirmation rate as a percentage of the total population, not as a percentage of the putative re-IDs. By performing similar rec a similar rec record linkage exercise of the putative re-IDs against the CEF, looking for exact matches on all variables, including PIC, block, sex, age, race, and ethnicity, followed by a second pass looking for exact matches except for age, which is allowed to vary by plus or minus one year. Once these two passes have been completed, the matched records are the confirmed re-identifications using exact match on pick, block, sex, race to the 63 categories, and ethnicity, and a match on age of plus or minus one year as the definition of correct. The remaining unmatched records from the putative re-identifications of the reconstructed data are the unconfirmed re-IDs. This table shows the results of two such re-identification confirmation exercises. The first of these uses the combined commercial databases from uh, Experian Marketing Solutions Incorporated, Infogroup Incorporated, Melissa Data Corporation, Targus Information Corporation, and VSGI LLC as the source file for name, address, sex, and age. This exercise simulates data quality from around 2010 for an external attacker relying on consumer information from these databases. These results are in the row labeled commercial. Putative re-identifications for this simulation were 138 million, which is 45% of the 2010 census resident population of the US. Confirmed re-identifications were 52 million, 17% of the same population. Using the commercial data as a source for name, address, sex, and age is a best case assumption. We know that these data exist, and we know they were available from around 2010 because that is when the Census Bureau acquired them. An external attacker, using the versions that the Census Bureau acquired and the relatively straightforward uh, methodology I outlined a moment ago, would succeed at least as often as we did. That means that at least 52 million persons enumerated during the 2010 census could be correctly re-identified using the strategy outlined here. Now, suppose the external attacker had name, address, sex, and age data of much better quality than the five commercial sources that we used in that simulation. How much better could the, that attacker do using the same strategy? 
Well, this question can be answered by substituting the name, address, sex, and age data from the 2010 CEF as the source file in the putative reidentification simulation. Now, this is not cheating because no extra information in the CEF, such as race, ethnicity, or household structure, is used for the source file in the simulation. Hence, it's a proper worst case scenario to examine. Uh, and this is the one historically used by the Census Bureau in assessing microdata reidentification risks. If the external data on name, address, sex, and age are comparable to the 2010 census, then the attacker would be able to putatively reidentify 238 million persons, well, 77% of the 2010 census resident U.S. population. Confirmed reidentifications would be 179 million people, 58% of the population. That means that with the best quality external data relative to the 2010 census, as many as 179 million persons could be correctly re-identified using the attack strategy I've been discussing. Now, the record linkage results reported in the left-hand table here can be interpreted using two additional statistical quality measures, the recall rate and the precision rate. Taken together, these measures assess how successful an attacker can be at re-identifying records and how confident the attacker would be in those re-identifications. The recall rate is the percentage of available source records that are correctly re-identified. The, the numerator is the same as the confirmation rate, uh, but its denominator is the number of records in the source file with sufficient information to perform the putative re-identification linkage. For the two source files analyzed in these simulations, the denominators for the recall rates are the records with PIC, block, sex, and age identified on the prior slide, which gives the count of records with sufficient information to generate a putative match. The table on the left shows the recall rates for the two experiments. Both are greater than the respective confirmation rate because both have the commercial data and the CEF have, sorry, because both the commercial data and the CEF have fewer usable records than the actual U.S. resident population. A critical result is that the recall rate of 64% when the CEF is used is the source file. Uh, this result means that an external attacker with high quality name, address, sex, and age information succeeds in re-identification almost two times out of three. Now, the precision rate is the ratio of confirmed to putative re-identifications. It answers the question, how often is the attacker's claimed re-identification correct as a percentage of the names the attacker attached to the reconstructed census microdata? The table on the right summarizes the precision rates for the two experiments. The precision of the simulation using the commercial data files was 38%. That's the first row of the table on the right. Uh, the precision of the worst case experiment is 75%. That's the second row. This result means that an attacker using high quality name, address, sex, and age data would be correct three times out of four. Now, this table disaggregates the precision rates by block size and shows that the reconstructed abetted re-identification attack simulated by the Census Bureau has very high precision precisely in the blocks that are most vulnerable to such an attack, whether one uses the best case or worst case scenarios. Uh, in blocks with populations between one and nine people, the re-identification attack had a precision of 72% when using commercial data available from 2010. This means that an attacker has a clean public predictor of the success of the re-identification attack. Fieldwork in sparsely populated blocks can confirm this precision uh, as can sophisticated Bayesian methods like entity resolution without the fieldwork. Now, if the attacker had better quality name, address, sex, and age data than were available in 2010, which is certainly a plausible assumption, then the worst case analysis for blocks with populations of one to nine people would be a precision of uh, almost 97%, uh, more precise than the 95% confidence interval that's often used as a test in statistics. Again, this can be confirmed by fieldwork or by Bayesian entity resolution. Uh, the situation is only a little better for the 68 million people who live in blocks with populations of between 10 and 49. Uh, the precision of the 2010 year of commercial data is 53.6%. Uh, 
which is correct more than half of the time. Uh, and the precision with high quality external data is almost 92%. Uh, although the best, case the best case precisions for block populations of 50 or more are less than one half, the worst case precision, even in the most populous blocks, is always greater than one half. An attacker with high quality external data is always more likely to be correct than to be wrong. With high quality data, uh, the attacker would be correct on average three times out of four, regardless of the number of people who live within the block. The Census Bureau believed in 2010 that it was necessary to coarsen geographic identity identifiers and microdata such that the minimum population for any published geography was at least 100,000 people. Those were the public use microdata areas or PUMAs. Our simulated reconstruction of vetted re-identification attack demonstrated that the tabular summaries from the 2010 census can be converted into a 100% microdata file with geographic precision down to the census block level. Our simulated attack demonstrated that depending on the quality of the external data used, between 52 million and 179 million respondents to the 2010 census can be correctly re-identified from those reconstructed microdata. Stronger privacy protections, such as those in the 2010 Census Disclosure Avoidance System, are absolutely necessary to protect against these reconstruction abetted attacks. Uh, if you would like to stay updated on our development of the 2020 Disclosure Avoidance System, please subscribe to our newsletter. Uh, we send out updates every couple of weeks with the latest information on the development and implementation of the 2020 DAS. And if you'd like to learn more about the modernization of our disclosure avoidance methods for the 2010 census, uh, check out our website. Uh, we have a wide array of useful resources, uh, including frequently asked questions, fact sheets, videos, blogs, and much, much more. And please join us for the remaining webinars in this series. Uh, next Thursday, uh, we'll be doing a deep dive into how the disclosure avoidance system's top-down algorithm works. Uh, on Friday the 14th, uh, we will be highlighting the detailed summary metrics from our April 2021 demonstration data release. And on Friday, May 21st, we'll be doing uh, an analysis of uh, our empirical assessments of the recent demonstration data for the Redistricting and Voting Rights Act use cases. Uh, and with that, I will uh, stop sharing my screen, and uh, Nathan Rolando and I will be happy to answer your questions. Hey, Michael, this is Megan. I'm, I know you haven't gotten a chance to read through all of the Q&A yet, so I thought I'd start you off with some of the more general questions, and then we can dive into the really specific and technical ones. So some of the Q&A um, folks seem to be asking um, sort of where this reconstruction model came from. Like, how did we uh, choose this model for, for how we did our reconstruction and re-identification experiments? Um, so that people can have a little bit more context about uh, where this came from. Is this, this something that the Census Bureau invented, or, or is it something that's commonly used? So I will uh, let Rolando or Nathan answer that one, since they've been doing most of the, the, the burden of performing these, uh, these simulations. Rolando? Rolando or Nathan, if you're talking, you're on mute. I'm going I'm to let Rolando take that one. Rolando, if you're speaking, you're muted. Oh, there we go. Rolando, we can't hear you. Still muted. Still muted. The joys of technology. <laughs> while we're while while you're trying to get off mute, let me let me throw another question to you. Um, a lot of the questions seem to be asking sort of what uh, how complex these kinds of reconstructions are. Um, so. I was wondering if any of you could speak to that a little bit. We know, you know, Michael spoke about that, that simple reconstruction work being done in 0.3 seconds on a 2013 MacBook, but the the broader the broader uh, experiment that y'all ran, how complex is that kind of of work? So I'll, I'll start with that one, but then I'd, I'd so love I'm to. On. I'm on if you want me to answer things. Oh, sorry. Okay. Well, let, let's let, let's answer this one, and then and then we can we can get that. So um, 
At its, at its most basic, um, you can think of the process of reconstructing the data as very similar to the kinds of algebra problems that you probably did in your high school algebra class, where you have um, two or three unknown variables and three equations, uh, and you have to uh, solve for the unknowns by, by solving the system of equations. That's, that's exactly what we do. You essentially, um, you convert uh, the individual table uh, tabular data into a series of equations, and then you can solve for the individual level microdata. It's just solving for the unknowns. Um, Nathan or Rolando, do you want to add to that? Yeah, that's right. So we, you know, the algorithm proceeds um, track by track. It then, and within each track, for each block that the track has, it does exactly the kind of math that Michael was just talking about. So you have a set of tables, which Michael looked at in his presentation. Those imply a set of constraints that you have put um, into a linear solver. You put them in, Garobi does its magic and gives you a solution. You can then turn that solution into a set of microdata, and that is your reconstructed microdata for the block. Um, you know, and current, currently we can get run times on this kind of thing down to, as a Fermi estimate, uh, just one day or so. Of the whole country. Ah. That's really helpful. And back to that first question, is this sort of reconstruction attack model, experiment model, something that the Census Bureau designed or, or is it something that's, you know, commonly used externally? How did, how did this sort of experiment come to pass? So, so I mean, we designed the system, but the, the the theory of taking consistent tables like we released in the SF1 and the PL94 tables and turning those into a set of microdata um, is, is not something yeah, that the census has, has thought up on its own. Um, it's, just, it's just algebra, like Michael said. And when you only have a small set of tables, you don't necessarily have enough data to produce an exact solution. Um, but we release a lot of tables uh, in our 2010 census product, so we're able to do this kind of reconstruction. Um, much of the work initially is just getting the constraints set up for the solver, and then once you have that, that's all you need. Helpful, and that leads to a question that actually just got asked in the Q&A, so we'll just pop it in right now. Are the, are the tabular sum summaries that you used in the ReID uh, experiments, are those typical files that are released to the public, or are those files that would normally be confidential, and so you only have access to them because you work at the Bureau? The ones used for the reconstruction? Yep. You can get those from data.census.gov. Got it. So Thank you. Those are some of, some of the most commonly used public tables that we release for the census. Got so it. There's, very, very helpful. There's been a, another pretty common question about uh, random guessing and the efficacy of of uh, how well you could do by just guessing randomly. Uh, and so I think that's going to importantly turn on what type of, um, a, what type of model you want to use, right? So, you know, you, you could imagine that you have the race and ethnicity distributions as published in the 2010 decennial and then use those to guess in proportion. Uh, alternatively, you could say, let's say I have those shares, but I, I want to maximize the number of records I get right you might use the modal uh, race and ethnicity by block and say, okay, well, I only want to, but uh, that's going to have important impl impl implications for the, the racial and ethnicity composition of the confirmed records that you get. So in, in, terms, in terms of thinking about a baseline, you kind of got to think about what data you have available to you uh, in order to make those guesses, and then how you want to balance the error for modal and non-modal uh, race and ethnicity groups. Got it. And there was another um, there was another question along uh, just to to clarify something that you had said in the presentation, Michael. Uh, Jan had asked, you know, if you had a good list of of um, names and you constructed a database duplicating those names with all possible ages and genders and such, would you get a hundred percent confirmation rate for those names? It's in the same sort of set of questions, so maybe something back to, to, to Rolando. 
Can we repeat that? I'm not really understanding what they're asking there. Sorry about that. Sorry, I'm just scrolling back to the Q, to the question. Was And it, it may be something that we need to follow up with you about, Jan, but the question was if, if you had a good list of names and constructed a database that duplicated those names with every possible age and gender um, and did this type of test, you'd get a 100% confirmation rate for those names. So I think I think the question is about, it, it's along the same lines of, of what you could get if you were sort of reconstructing a, a random file. But, well, I mean, if, but so, you, if so, you consider the entire possible set of data you could observe, then I guess I don't understand what would be the benefit of trying to do a comparison to that file. I think, I think I get the intuition of it, Rolando. It's, and it's uh, it you the, the point I think is that if you did that, right? If you did the Cartesian product of every pick with every race and ethnicity and age and sex, it's true that the right one would always be in there. Uh, but if you did that, then you would you'd never know which your the false positive rate would be really would really swamp your ability to make sense of of uh, the matches that you make. Got it. I, I'm There's guessing that. I'm, I, yeah, I think that, I think that's the intuition. Yeah, got it, got it. And there's a couple questions in here that are that are kind of about what data you have to use for this attack and what things would look like if it, if we publish different data. So one of the questions is about if you know the PL ninety four one seventy one files have a lot of very detailed race and ethnicity data at the block level. Um, so what would it look like if we used, you know, a, some sort of binning of races? An analogous question would be um, if the block level population counts were not uh, invariant like they were in 2010, what would that do to the reconstruction rates? Is there anything you can tell us about how those rates would change with different assumptions and in, in what kind of data is published? Well, so in the, for the re-identification, what was matched to the commercial databases was age and sex. So if you coarsened race and ethnicity, you would just get back coarsened race and ethnicity when you tried to do your re-identification. That would still be a disclosure. It would just be a disclosure at a coarser level of detail. Um, should, remind me of the second part of the question. How do the reconstruction rates shape up if we make it a little harder for folks by, um, by not holding the block level population count invariant? It, it, would, it would make the re-identification harder. Got it. Do we ha have any detail on that, or or some, is that something we can get back to folks on as well? That's something you have to get back on. We have not run those kinds of, uh, of um, demonstrations yet. Got it. I'm getting a little echo on your phone, but it's probably because I'm not on mute. So let me fix that. It looks like we're answering a lot of these questions right in the Q&A, which is fan fantastic. Um, let me just zoom up. While you're, uh, while you're um, searching for the yep. next question, I want to expand on what Rolanda just said. Um, so the, the issue of uncertainty in the population counts at the block level is actually a major one because one of the things that made the reconstruction much easier was knowing exactly how many records there needed to be in each block. Uh, and then being able to cross-reference between the tables that were published at the, the track level and those that were published at the block level, um, you were able to exactly uh, infer a, an individual's location in the reconstruction. Introducing uncertainty in the exact population of uh, the blocks um, essentially uh, expands the number of possible reconstructions um, and essentially you, it makes it more difficult for you to know which of the possible reconstructions you perform is the right one. Uh, and so it, it, it can significantly inhibit your ability to not just accurately reconstruct the data, but then to be able to accurately re-identify it. Got it. All right, a few more questions in here. The, um, from from Eric, Eric asks, you know, the presentation used the specific swapping rules as a starting point for the logic the invariance. If if we didn't uh, publish the details of the swapping procedure, would that be effective as a 
privacy control measure, would you still be able to do this kind of reconstruction even if you didn't know what those invariants were? So that's that's a, a great question. And I'll start and then I'd, I'd love to hear Rolanda with Nathan as well. But um, it's one of the interesting things about swapping as a methodology is that um, you, you typically have to keep some of your implementation parameters secret in order to um, prevent reverse engineering of the unswapped records. Um, but essentially what we, what we found here is that um, there are a number of ways of inferring what the swapping parameters are. Um, but more than that, um, what we've demonstrated through some of the, the statistics in the slide is that swapping is designed to protect population uniques, but the actual occurrence of population uniques are, are substantially larger um, than what your, your typical swap rates would be. Uh, and so if, if the population uniques are the records that are most at risk, then even with more sophisticated swapping procedures that you keep all of the parameters secret, you still would likely be leaving a large proportion of your vulnerable records vulnerable. Rolanda, do you want to add to that? Well, I was just going to say that neither the reconstruction nor identification code used for this experiment had any aspect of the swap parameters as input. So, you know, and anyone can do this, even though we haven't given out the swap parameters. Got it. Okay, so a couple of people have asked, one person asked if we've done work to merge blocks with low population numbers um, to help reduce re-identification risk. Someone else asked about how how block level data became the lowest level of geography for our data tabulations. Uh, so I think the question there is, does, would, would sort of aggregation of the smaller blocks help and, and is there a reason why we why we publish the data at the block level? That's getting into the larger census issues here. Um, uh, the block level, like the, the introduction of, of data products at the block level was done largely in response to uh, requests from data users who were, were asking for, for more granular information. Um, and that more granular information is what introduces the, the disclosure risk. Uh, prior to 1990, um, when like we, as an agency, protected largely protected the data products by suppressing low-level information, and by by aggregating by geography by only publishing higher-level tabular summaries, you reduce the occurrence of population uniques and you make it harder to pick out specific individuals within those areas. Um, so yeah, I mean, not publishing block level data would certainly decrease disclosure risk, but um, there's lots of demand out there for block level data. So so going that route would be highly unpopular. <laughs> um, I would just add to that, Michael, that you know, the, the typical standard at the Census Bureau for a microdata product is that they have um, geographies associated with populations of 100,000 people or more. Um, that's certainly combining a lot of blocks. Um, and so the, the, the real issue here is that we have these table products that are at much finer levels of geography that in essence can be combined to produce microdata that is at much smaller levels of geography and population detail than we would typically allow to be released from a microdata product. And that, that's a key point there because essentially what what the process of database reconstruction really demonstrates is that um, you can't think of rules for tabular data and rules for microdata as different animals. That when you're releasing large amounts of tabular data with very fine levels of geography in it, that is the equivalent of releasing microdata. Uh, and so you, you have to approach the disclosure avoidance process from the perspective of, how would you protect these? Were you releasing a microdata file? Because that's essentially what they are. There are really quite a few questions in here about um, sort of asking about what what factors are protective or, or um, 
not protective in the census data that we publish. Publish, for example, folks that were asking about, uh, you know, the redistricting file, the PL file, only has age over and under 18 for blocks. So isn't that protective for re-identification? Given that these experiments look, were really, you know, digging into single years of age, um, other folks were asking about, you know, the use of, of tools like imputation that uh, themselves, you know, create, create some protective factors. What impact do they have on our ability uh, to do reconstruction? Are either of those things that are we can give under a three minute answer to? Yeah, I, I can attempt to anyway. Um, so to so the first one, um, it, it, one of the, the most fundamental rules uh, for disclosure avoidance uh, in any context uh, is that you can't just think of the data products in isolation. And you can't approach disclosure avoidance as a, like a table by table or a release by release. Um, from that perspective because the disclosure risk comes from the interaction of the different data that you're releasing in different ways. Uh, so yeah, while um, you might not be able to perform an accurate reconstruction from table P1 by itself or from table P4 by itself, um, the intersection of those tables in different ways is what creates the disclosure risk. Uh, and so, um, yeah, you, you can't think of them in, in isolation. Um, the second... Can I follow up on that, Michael? Sure. Was that true for for the disclosure of wooden systems we used in the, in the past as well, or is that something unique to how we think about reconstruction? Oh, no, that's that's been... The, the fact that you have to think of all releases together has been uh, widely recognized by the federal statistical system as, as necessary since the 1970s. Um, so yeah, that's that's um, widely regarded as a requirement. Um, to your to your other question uh, about, and I'm blanking on what your other question was. It was just about it was about imputation, the imputation. or other sources yeah. of error. Um, the issue there is that yeah, I mean any any introduction of uncertainty is going to impact um, your overall disclosure risk, um, and I mean it. it the act of editing and imputing census responses to improve data quality, it does introduce some uncertainty. Uh, but you can't rely on data quality as a mechanism of disclosure control because the impact of data quality is not uniform across your data collection. Um, some individuals will be imputed with greater frequency than others. Uh, some some demographics will be edited and imputed with, with greater likelihood. Um, so your, the amount of error that that introduces is not uniform, uh, and thus you would be leaving large portions of the population less protected as a result. So yeah, no, you, 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 can't, you can't rely on data quality as a data protection technique. Got it. We're, we're right at 2 p.m., but Nathan, Rolando, Michael, I know you've been looking at a number of the questions in the Q&A. Are there any other questions you want to, you just have a burning need to answer out loud before we wrap up? Well, if I could just add on to Michael's statement there, you know, with respect to things like, well, will only releasing voter age help with reconstruction re-identification? I'd just like to remind people that we didn't use all the possible data we could have in this experiment. There was no aspects of interpersonal relationships that were used. We didn't use anything related to housing unit items such as tenure. Um, so, you know, if something maybe helps with the age aspect of it, well, there's other information that people have provided us that people could do these kinds of experiments on. Um, and so, especially for products down the road, you know, so there's our surveys that have even more information that people can do these things with, you know, we're going to have to keep this conversation going about what makes things risky and how do we actually provide guarantees against it. Yeah, I appreciate that. I mean, and that's a great segue to um, the question of if people feel, didn't feel like their an, that they their answer was was fully their their question was fully answered during this webinar, or they want to follow up to ask a question that they didn't think of while we were on on the line. How can they get in, in contact with the team? Sorry, my my audio was cutting out on that, Megan. Can you repeat <laughs> the question? Sorry. Oh, so sorry. I was just asking if people have 
follow-up questions or, or just want more detail to the answer that they got here on the webinar, how can they follow up with the team to ask more or to give more feedback? Oh, absolutely, and, and we, we greatly appreciate getting feedback from, from our data users and, and the broader stakeholder community, so, so please. Um, uh, the best way to, uh, to ask questions or provide feedback is through our dedicated email box. Uh, it's 2020-DAS, 2020-DAS, at census.gov. Thanks so much. Any final words, Michael, Nathan, Rolando? Just uh, thank you, uh, everyone who attended. Thank you to uh, my Census Bureau colleagues who have participated today. Uh, and please join us for the upcoming webinars in this series. Thank you. Great. This has been great. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may disconnect at this time.